prior to white settlement, of course, there were Aboriginal structures in Melbourne, which then gave way to uh, structures that were built by the white settlers. To Dinky Little Port, and then gold is discovered in the 1850s. You know, Melbourne's not even 20, and it just blows up. The first settlers here, they built individual houses on big lots, and then because there were only horse and carts and feet, relatively high density housing was the, the next step, and that was terraces, which was exactly what they were building in, in across the UK at the time. All of them have this sort of British roots, and with that they also have a um, sort of British culture built in, in the room sizes, um, a smaller um, life is sort of private within the home as well. I don't just mean for the nuclear family, I mean for people within the home. Um, and these were mainly Georgian influence, which uh, was the architecture of the time. And uh, these were inappropriate for the climate and the conditions really. And of course that then meant that the next phase in development was Victorian architecture. And then as the century went on, Victorian architecture in general got more and more elaborate. And we went from plain brick terraces without verandas and with roofs that you could see, to el incredibly elaborate facades that went a long way up past the roof in cement rendered balustrades and um, lady faces and masks and swags and clamshell and the Victorians like to mix and match and throw it all together. And this gave way to architecture that was becoming more influenced by Hollywood movies. So for example in the 1920s you saw Californian bungalows being built and then after that we had the Art Deco influence and then modernist. Look at things like uh, the modernist movement of the you know, 30s, 40s, 50s. When you're looking at that, you're often looking at Jewish architects who are forced to flee Europe and who uh, come to Australia and do amazing things. More renowned um, modernist designers like um, Robin Boyd or Roy Grounds, um, I believe that they all submitted designs for the small homes um, services. So different people come to like places like David Jones and buy these plans for modernist homes. They're sort of directed more towards uh, a future aesthetic and in that way a lot of migrants were able to I guess buy into the Australian dream and be part of an Australian future. It is definitely part of Melbourne's DNA that we have creative architects who are allowed and encouraged to be creative certainly compared to many other cities though people from those cities come here and say what's going on here everything's looks completely different they're crazy. <laughs> There's 3.3 million migrants that come to Australia after the war. That's, I guess, when you see the building of modern Melbourne as we sort of know it today. When their families come over, they all do need homes, and so you do see this building of the suburban, this growth of suburban sprawl. Whenever the economy picks up, then development picks up and the city grows. And the city has tended to grow um, pretty much the same way outwards throughout its history, aided and abetted by transport. The thing that made the biggest difference to the way the city expanded was the advent of the railway, which is of course pretty early in the career of the city, but uh, the city has developed, uh, you know, the railway was the scaffold for the city. So that takes in the middle suburbs with the Victorian Edwardian and interwar housing, and then the next ring, ring out, is the 1950s suburbs, and then 60s and 70s, etc. beyond that. It's Melbourne in the late 60s, you know, there was a general feeling we don't want to become Los Angeles, and state government is trying to make us you know into that kind of a freeway oriented city. There wasn't such a thing really as heritage protection until the late 70s and then into the 1980s. Well by then Melbourne was old enough to look backwards and say well we like these things that we built in the past uh, and that was the beginning of Melbourne growing in on itself again and coming back to the middle out from the fringes with the whole anti-freeway movement, anti-freeways uh, pro-heritage. The density of Melbourne I think is one of the nice things about Melbourne. I, th I also feel that it's allowed to be or it's enabled to be low density because of public transport infrastructure and technology. If it moved to a higher density it wouldn't be the Melbourne that we know. So wh where is it? You know, what is it? Prior to uh, the 50s when, when uh, the change first started, Melbourne was really just a business and shopping district. With the European influence and the cafes coming into the city and people living into the city, it's brought Melbourne out into the streets more. The interesting thing though is that migrants are just all called migrants, right? They're not 
differentiated, yet they've all got very different stories as to why they came here and how they came here and the culture that they bring with them. It's ended up with quite a big effect on us socially and culturally still today because you've got, you know, Greek um, areas and Italian and Jewish and each of them had different food and traditions and types of restaurants that might be locally created to suit the needs of that group. In um, Bligon Street, the first cafe started putting chairs and tables out on the street and we all said, but that won't work, everyone, it's too cold in winter, um, but it did work and now everyone does it and they've got heaters. That 1970s, 80s period is when Melbourne is you know, finally being pulled out of what I guess we would now see as doldrums to make the central city and its surrounds uh, workable and usable and you know, entertaining and, and delightful. It took a, a lot of work. You know, some of the solutions I think were inappropriate, but um, a lot of them were quite visionary. Uh, Meyer's place in the city was the first laneway bar and then as soon as they were open, they were inundated. It was so popular, everyone went at them, they filled up the whole lane and suddenly everyone discovered that there were laneways in the city that you could stand in and that was fine. And it was actually better because it was away from the traffic and um, it just went on and on and on. Melbourne has, has undergone a dramatic change in that we've lost a lot of our manufacturing and this gave rise, of course, to the large amount of, of industrial architecture which could be used for housing. In Melbourne, the zoning, you know, it's residential, industrial, commercial, and commercial allows residential <laughs> and, and mixed use, which allows residential, commercial, and, and commercial includes retail as well as offices. So it's actually quite flexible, and there's not that many areas in the sort of inner, inner Melbourne that are just one zone or the other that allows only one thing. The planners have started to look at uh, building communities, particularly through educational facilities or other hubs and precincts and so on. There's a long, long history of um, impressive and uh, exciting civic buildings that tell people what kind of community they live in and what sort of place they are and, and who they are. Melbourne uh, is in many respects too big to be the kind of city that we that we want it to be. I don't want to uh, come over all utopian, but I feel like the answer is to start to invest heavily in places in, in, other, in other cities or new cities and encourage people to uh, decentralise. Well, I hope in the next 20 years, there will be a bit of winding back of the free for all that we've had for the last 20 years, when the regulations kind of disappeared or were ignored and we had and not much control. I'm hoping that future architects and urban planners understand there's a huge socio-cultural component in what in design. You know, gender, class, nationality, tradition has all been um, embodied in home. You know, aesthetics that they can go on to, I guess, be more aware of how that might then affect our future populations. There's always a place for good design and beautiful things in our lives and we should try where possible to, to move in a direction that makes us feel good.